Welcome to Face to Face with me, Subi Shah, and me, Soon Zaid. May Soon Women Deliver are delighted to have you here with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, what do I begin with? What's a good opener? And I read all about you and saw your amazing TED Talk, and I realized we have something in common. Both of us have parents who are first cousins. Oh, wow, really? You're <laughs> yeah. inbred, too. I'm That's inbred, awesome. too. <laughs> Tell me about your childhood and your family background. Okay, well, first of all, I have to give some advice to everyone who's listening. Do not marry your first cousin. It was okay to do that when you had to ride a camel for five days to meet someone who wasn't related to you. But now we have Tinder, and we don't need to marry our siblings anymore. So no more cousin love. Um, so I like to say I have an origin story like superheroes. Uh, I'm the youngest of four girls, and my parents didn't think that God was going to be so generous as to bless them with another girl child, so they had only prepared a name for a boy. They were going to name me a very original name. You've probably never heard it. They were going to name me Muhammad. And then when I came out as a girl, they decided to name me Muhammadia. But I lucked out because the doctor said I was going to die. And my parents didn't want to waste such a good name on an angel baby. So they named me Maysoon instead, which means lemur. So my parents named their brown shaking baby monkey, and I survived. And the reason they were worried that I was going to die is that the doctor who delivered me was drunk. So I lost a good amount of oxygen, and as a result, I have cerebral palsy. And cerebral palsy is a neurological disorder, but it's like different in everyone. So there are some people who are nonverbal, there are some who are wheelchair users. In my case, I shake all the time. I like to say I shake it, shake it, shake it, like Taylor Swift, but she wants to shake and mine's involuntary. So that's my origin story. And I grew up in Cliffside Park, New Jersey, in the United States, and I spent my summers in Palestine. So, like, school days on the Jersey Shore, summer's in a war, and it very much informed who I am today. Yeah. I mean, how often do you go back to Palestine? What's the situation? I try to go back four times a year. If I don't go back once a year, I, I, I won't make it to the next year. I'm addicted to Palestine. I love it there. Um, I did a lot of charity work for about a decade. I worked on mainstreaming children with disabilities into the Palestinian school system because children... Children worldwide have limited access to education. When you add disability to that and you're in a war zone or any sort of oppressed situation, it's much more likely for disabled kids not to have access to education. So I dedicated about a decade of my life to working in the West Bank, physically being there three, four months a year, working on mainstreaming children. And then my career took off. And I just didn't have the time that I had before. So now I've switched my support to philanthropy and finding ways to use my success to help, first of all, amplify the needs of children with disabilities worldwide, but also fund and sponsor whatever I can to make their right to education a reality. That's wonderful to hear. That's it, yeah. But I never you thought I would have to fight for disabled rights in America. No. And I have spent the past 18 months fighting against rollbacks for protections for disabled students, access to education for disabled students. It's a really, really scary time in the United States, and I never thought that I would have to be doing this disability mainstreaming work uh, stateside, but I am. I mean, you, yeah, you've talked about, in previous interviews I've seen, especially your excellent TED Talk. Thank you. Um, you've talked about how you basically, I mean, you're a woman, you've got... I say, I say in the oppressing yeah. Olympics, I'd win a gold medal. Exactly. Because I'm cover... Palestinian, Muslim, disabled, a woman of color, yep. and Donald Trump's my president. So if you don't feel better about <laughs> yourself, you really should. Yeah. There's not much more oppressed you can get. Exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, you haven't had it easy. No. But you're such a resilient person and you've got such a sharp sense of humor. I mean, where does that confidence come from? The confidence comes from my parents. And I really wish that wasn't the answer because so often people with disabilities worldwide reach out to me and say, how do I do it? What do I need? Mm -hmm. And so many people don't have parents who support them. I happen to be blessed and lucky to have I say, my dad was a teddy bear and my mom was a tyrant, and that was exactly what I needed in my life. My mom never let me do less than my sisters. She never let me say can't without trying. If my sisters got A's, I got A's. We're from immigrant families, and immigrant families aren't like, you tried. Mm. They're like, get a 96 or a 100. And that 
drive that she gave me made me not feel like I was less or unequal to my sisters. She expected me to achieve what they did, and that really gave me a sense of confidence and purpose. My dad was my biggest cheerleader. Like, I mean, he's really like a Disney dad, like this person who just cheers you on and lifts you up. And my dad physically, physically taught me how to walk. Now, there's no shame in not walking or using any mobility device you need. But he knew I was going to be spending time in Ramallah, where it wasn't as accessible as New Jersey. So my dad physically put my feet on his feet and taught me how to walk. Wow. And then in my TED talk, I talk about his other method was to dangle a dollar bill in front of me and have me chase it. My inner stripper was very, very strong. <laughs> so it worked out well. So my confidence came from, first of all, parents who believed in me and friends who didn't bully me. I've had the same seven girlfriends since I was in kindergarten. They never made fun of me. They never bullied me. They were all like confirmation. I was like, I'm fasting. I can't eat the communion cracker. That seems to be the only thing between me and the cracker. But like, you know, I, I had a team of women who supported me from a really, really young age. And then the final thing was, my parents couldn't afford physical therapy, so they sent me a tap dancing class. So I've been on stage since I was five years old, and I was on stage before social media. So I didn't know that I was getting standing ovations because I was inspirational. I thought it was because I was a badass tap dancer. And that yeah, really gave me confidence as a performer. I loved being on stage. I loved the applause. Like, if you see right, right now, I don't get nervous ever. It's like, the world is a stage and I like being on it. Wonderful. Well, it's where you belong. Well, um, why is Women Deliver an important conference for you? You're here in Vancouver. The most important thing about it is the fact that they're gathering women from all over the world who might not have had the access to information and privilege that I've had. And the ability to be a functional disabled person on stage showing that, you know, we are not snowflake angel, you know, babies who smile all the time. We're adults. We have problems. We have relationships. We have challenges. We have successes. It's such a privilege to be able to show that image to women worldwide who may not have ever seen anyone who looks like them doing what I'm doing today. Going back to your, the start of your stage yes. career, oh God. Um, tell, me, um, tell me about what happened for you when you were studying at university. And right. So, my parents, when I was growing up, they taught us to dream big. And what that meant was either become a lawyer, doctor, or engineer. Of course. But my dream, like most Muslim girls exactly. growing up in America, was to be on General Hospital on American daytime soap. And so I decided to pursue that by going to university and studying theater. And I was getting A's in all of my classes. My professors would weep when I would play Laura from The Glass Menagerie, a very famous disabled character. But I didn't get cast in any of the shows. I couldn't figure out what's going on. I'm like, how am I getting an A in acting, but I'm not getting cast in any of the shows? Senior year, they do a show called They Dance Real Slow in Jackson. It's about a girl with cerebral palsy. So I'm like, it's going to be me. Like, I'm so excited. <laughs> it's a moment. Yeah, I don't get the part. And so I go to the head. They give it to this non-palsy chick. And so I go to the head of the theater department. I'm like, I was literally born to play this role. Like, I'm using the word literally correctly in the sentence and born incorrectly because I was never actually born. But... Um, and that's when I realized that college was imitating Hollywood. So, like, people with disabilities are 20% of the population. With 2% of the images that you see on TV, of those 2%, 95% are played by non-disabled actors. So the reality is, people who look like me are not on TV. And when you do see disability, it is white and it is men. So it's really a huge challenge to be a woman of color not a size zero to six, you know, which is what the size you should be in Hollywood is, but to also have a disability. So where I saw myself was in the world of comedy. Richard Pryor really resonated oh, with me. Oh, he's the one. Yeah. yeah. So when I was a kid, my parents should have monitored my television because I was watching General Hospital and Richard Pryor and should have been watching neither. But when I was growing up, he was a wheelchair user already. And he was one of the greatest comics 
on yeah. earth and yeah. he was brown you know he's a black man and so i was like oh i'll just become a comedian and then i'll do a movie with gene wilder and it'll be fantastic you know Why not? and so i became a comic and i went to a very famous comedy club in new york city called caroline's and i walked limped in signed up for a class and I had an amazing teacher named Mike Irwin, and he made us get on stage from the very first day. I went on stage, and I was doing all these potty jokes and being, like, really edgy and using slurs and doing everything that comics in the 2000s did. And the teacher said, what is going on? Why are you, like, flailing around? And I was like, oh, I have cerebral palsy. It's not a big deal. He's like, you have to talk about it. And I was like, no, I don't want to talk about my disability. He goes, listen, people are going to think you're either drunk or nervous. So if you don't address it, they're going to be distracted your whole routine. And there, the premise for the Impression, Impression Olympics was born. Because the first time I ever went on stage, I said, my name is Mason Zayed. I'm a Palestinian Muslim virgin with cerebral palsy from New Jersey. And if you don't be feel bad about yourself, maybe you should. And what I did was I couched the CP in everything else that defined me. Yeah. It wasn't the only thing. It was part of who I was. Yeah. But I got it out of the way so that the audience was comfortable. Yeah, yeah. And then throughout the years, I started doing more jokes about disability because I realized, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And when you have that platform, you have to call out ableism. You have to point out the stuff that people do that's abusive that they may not realize is abusive. So disability has become a bigger part of my stand-up comedy because it's, it's important to me, you know. Uh, also, being a, you know, a, a Palestinian origin, yes. How do people react? You know, you took well, part of so Arabs Gone Wild. Yeah, tell so me about that. I had a Live Nation tour called Arabs Gone Wild. I produced the New York Arab American Comedy Festival. Now in its 16th year wow. of sold out shows in New York City that I co-produced with Dino Vidala, my partner in comedy crime. And we also did a documentary called The Muslims Are Coming and Muslim Funny Fest. Right. So. One of the things post 9-11 was it was really important to combat negative images of Arabs in media, but also to make people understand that Arab and Muslim are not synonymous, that you can be Arab in any religion and you can be Muslim in any race, nationality, ethnicity. And so we felt like, having studied history, it was so important to have positive images of Arabs and Muslim in media because we really feel like we're a community under siege. And when you study the history of the United States, when the Japanese were put in internment camps, the Italians were predominantly kept out because of the celebrity status of Italian Americans. So Dean and I were like, we need to have some high profile Muslims and high profile Arabs so that they don't throw us in camps. And this was 17 years ago, and I can't believe how much worse it is now and how much more important the work that I'm doing is now. But when you talk about being Palestinian, my favorite reaction to being Palestinian is people say, Palestine doesn't exist. Oh. So that means I don't exist. I'm just a scary ghost. You don't really see me right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, well, how have your family reacted to your comedy? Did you grow up being a funny girl? No, I was a drama queen. And when I was at college, I had designated weeping spots where I would go and cry in public so that people would stop and be like, oh my God, are you okay? So that I could see if like, my crying was convincing. I was full of drama. My dream was to be on a soap opera, not yeah, to be yeah. a comedian. So when I signed up for the comedy class, I had no idea what it took to be a comic. And it turned out that I was a natural. You are. Like, I don't even try. It's yeah. really sad. And I try to give people advice about, like, it's a struggle, and you got to write every day. And they're like, did you struggle? And I'm like, nope. <laughs> like, do you write every day? I'm like, yep. I do. Boom. <laughs> you know, I do. But I was a paid comic by my third show. I was doing a Live Nation tour within the first decade of my career. I am blessed and lucky to be one of the most book speakers in the world. I get to do corporate. I get to do colleges. I've opened for Pitbull, which was, like, amazing. You know, so it's, it's, it's a great career, and it's such an odd career for um, 
you know, an Arab woman yeah. and a Muslim woman. And talking of, talking of Arab women or Arabs in general, we're seeing more Arab origin right. on the big screen. You know, we've had just the big Freddie Mercury movie out. You've been With in Rami Malik. Uh, cinema as well. Rami <laughs> Youssef is on, uh, on Hulu. Yeah. So is this a flash in the pan? Is this just the latest Hollywood yeah, trend or about is it, it breaking of a glass ceiling? I talk about it a lot. So when we started the New York American Comedy Festival, we were pulling brown people off the street and we were, we were like, are you Arab? You can be. Just come into our festival. The reason is so many of this community was born to immigrant families. And immigrant families didn't have the time for the silliness of art. People needed to do professional stuff. This is the next generation coming up. So people like Rami Youssef, who has the show on Hulu, he started out at the New York Arab American Comedy Festival wow. as a teenager. Uh. Omar Mitwali, who you know is on The Affair and is doing the new Jason Bourne series, he started out at the New York Arab American Comedy Festival. So I can list like probably 90% of all the actors you see on TV started out with us. And I think that's why the next generation is... Um, there. I don't think it's a flash in the pan. I think it's part of the fight for diversity. And I think we are a really talented community. We have great writers and artists in our community that are finally getting a chance to shine. And one of the reasons for that is the World Wide Web. Bringing us back to Women Deliver, what would you say? I mean, we've got all these powerful, amazing women all in one place. And we're being watched across the world. What would you say to young people, young women, who are really struggling at the moment? What is the advice you give? I mean, you say you're not inspirational, which is just not, like, yeah. well, you are. No, well, I'm okay. <laughs> so that's, I think this is a good, like, little point. Yep. Um, I, don't, I don't mind inspiring people to pursue their dreams. I don't mind inspiring people to be better people in the world in general and better parents to disabled kids. What I mind is people who think I'm inspirational because I woke up this morning and put on a dress. Like, simply yeah. existing as a disabled person is not an inspiration. No. But if I do something as an artist, as a woman, as a Palestinian, as a tap dancer, that inspires you, that's great. The message that I want to send to women across the world is do not let anyone but you define find you. Don't let strangers decide who you are. Even your family doesn't get to pick who you are. Figure out who you want to be and be that person. And if there's nobody cheering for you, cheer for yourself. And most importantly, I know that it's not easy, but abuse is never okay. You never deserve to be yelled at. You never deserve to be dehumanized. You never deserve to be assaulted. So women need to know that if someone is being abusive, whether it's friend, family, or stranger, it should not be tolerated under any circumstances. And by all means necessary, you should extricate yourself from that situation because no one deserves it. That is a very powerful message. Macy Inside, you've been an absolute joy. Thank, Thank you, you very so much, much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.